Thanks. Good morning. Um, I take great pleasure in saying thank you to Lisa Berry for 25 years. She is not here. Um, she was more comfortable staying and working on the phone, but she's just about 10 feet from me. So, and I left my door open. So I think she can hear me. Um, so over those 25 years, there've been a lot of changes. There's been software changes and location changes, but what hasn't changed is the level of service that Lisa provides for uh, the writers and the community and, and, and their families. Um, I asked her peers to tell me something about, about Lisa that they were, that they thought of whenever they heard her name. And, and they all said, um, Lisa's very generous with her vast knowledge of how to book a paratransit ride. Some of the rides are very complicated. They might have a zone piece and a paratransit piece and a regular service piece. So um, she's helped all of them through the years. Um, I specifically included these two extra pictures other than her, her beautiful face, because Lisa's always ready to throw in for the hard work. So she assisted with some of the food box loading that we did, um, you know, back during the early days of COVID. Um, the other thing that Lisa does is, and you may not know, but when we're closed, we are still required to take paratransit ride requests, but of course nobody's here. So there can be dozens of rides on a voicemail. So she comes in extra early and sifts through them all. And some of them might be for an early ride. Uh, so that's something that she does all on her own. She's, she's very good at it, though I think that she's had to teach a few of her peers because she does like to take a vacation every once in a while. Um, and then her Halloween picture. Uh, Lisa has a great sense of fun and she's always willing to participate. And she has a great sense of humor. And you have to think if you're taking 130 calls in a day and many of those calls are pretty similar, you have to have a, a good sense of humor to, uh, to maintain that level of service that she has. So I'd just like to say thank you, Lisa Berry, for everything that you've done for the last 25 years. Thank you. All right, thank you for that. Um, moving on to citizen communications. Vicki or Les, do we have any? I'm not aware of receiving any. Vicki, have you received any? No, I haven't. All right, then we're going to move into the closed session. And Vicki, you'll create that. And then some people in this room get the option to leave. No option. <laughs> no option. <laughs> <laughs> they are invited to leave. <laughs> They're excited. <laughs> Okay, I will go ahead and send you all over and it'll be about 10 minutes. All right, thanks. Right, if it's gonna be longer than 10 minutes, I will be back on and let you all know. Hi, Audra. Hi, Audra, you can close the breakout room. Okay, it's closing right now. <laughs> you know me too well. <laughs> Every guy, he'll end up screwing this up so much. <laughs> oh, that's true. All right, moving on with our agenda. Uh, F1 has been pulled from the agenda, so we're gonna go right to the review of the 2023 budget. All right, draft budget. I thought I had two more minutes. Okay. I was gonna tell you, <laughs> you're right. not Thank you, that's all right. All right, well, good morning, everyone. Um, we're gonna talk about the draft 2023 budget and the priority. And actually, this setup is a little bit different. Um, normally, we talk a lot about the numbers, Kind of what is behind the numbers and we're going to flip that this year and going forward that will be our approach to talk about our priorities how we want to resource to our mission activities that support that and then narrow it down to what that turns out to look like in numbers um, the presentation i sent out yesterday has been tweaked a little bit um, 
Les gave me some good thoughts last night. So it's very similar to what you have, but I'll just point out the differences. So we can start there. That's good. So the um, mission, the budget is to source to the mission, source to these priorities, and these are the high level priorities that the team had talked about go back one? addressing. Yeah, so we started with our mission and just the four bullet points within our mission. And our goal is to take elements of this and weave it into the priorities, the actions that, that support the priorities and the budget overall. And so this is the summary of the five high priorities, not our only priorities, but the high ones that we're going to talk about today. Um, next, I'll talk about the activities that support them and how they enhance both our team, the community, um, and the general health overall of all of our operators and writers. Um, one question that I'm going to throw out there before we get much further is to have you all thinking about how do these priorities resonate with what's important to you and your constituents? with what WTA does and are we missing it? So we'll have an opportunity to look at this at least twice more, maybe more if you'd like. Um, so I really am looking forward to hearing what we're we missing. Our goal is that everyone sees themselves somewhere in this budget, whether it's a rural community, whether it's one of our writers, our choice writers that choose to write all the time, even if it's someone who doesn't write and has a family member. So we'll just start with that. Um, the 2023 priority actions. So our first priority we talked about was safety and security. Um, and we recognize that this is really a strategic threat to our ridership if our riders don't feel safe on the buses or on our concourses. So what you will see in the budget is the proposal to enhance our safety division under Jeff Benson. And we'll be asking for four positions to develop this team that will have a presence both at our facilities, on our, at our stations and on our buses to de-escalate situations, um, talk with folks that are maybe having some issues, behavioral issues, support our operators and our supervisors, and really address both a real and a perceived threat of safety on the buses. We've talked about the drug use down at BTS. Um, I heard recently that those bathrooms are on the way to being opened back up again. Uh, we've had porta parties down. I think we still were experiencing some drug use down there and some inappropriate behavior. So we're hoping that having folks down there will alleviate some of those. So they label safety officers versus security. I don't want to talk about what is the intention of that? How do we want folks to feel? Um, and we're looking at starting to stand that up first quarter of Q1 with hiring a supervisor and then developing a team of three other safety officers <laughs> folks, and hopefully to have it fully rolled out by the beginning of the third quarter. And if you have questions or anything, like I told my team today, if you want to jump in and add on, please feel free. I'll hop, hop in there, Absolutely. even though we'll talk about it later. But um, Jeff's doing a, uh, and, and Audra are doing a really good job going through the operator notes and trying to call through and see are there trends on locations where things are happening, routes, particular routes that where things are happening, times of day, those kinds of things, so that we can best allocate, uh, presuming uh, the board approves these positions, best allocate these folks to have the maximum uh, effect um, as we're doing this. And then uh, the, the other thing is, is, as the zero fare discussion continues and so forth, if the board were, if we were at WTA to adopt the zero fare philosophy, um, we need to have something in place to address the concerns that, that are there. So um, this is, a, as Shonda said, this is a kind of a strategic threat and a strategic looking forward uh, thing that we're trying to we can talk more about that when we have the positions. Sure. sure. All right. Thank you, Les. The next one is addressing equity issues and the needs of overburdened communities. So this ties into implementing the WJ2040 plan and the three E's that we had talked about. And we're also being asked to do this from the FTA and some of our funding sources. So we do have the new transit support grants through the Move Ahead Washington. And one of the goals of that is addressing overburdened communities. So we're taking a really global look at that in terms of how can we service the people that are already in communities that have good service and also looking at how do we serve folks that are kind of on the edge of our communities, so out in our rural communities. So the geographical um, access also. 
and Tim and his team have done a really good job of taking our normal way that we roll out service every year, which is 2% overall, and we just roll it out and really assessing where is that service needed? Does it make sense to roll it out at that level? We don't want to put service out that doesn't work for folks, that doesn't get them where they need to go. So his team's evaluated, where do we need that service? And you'll see that come through um, in a couple more slides. But Tim, did you want to talk about that at all? No, I would just say, and I, you're probably going to mention this in a further slide, but our main priority then for next year will be the uh, paratransit service and the, the changes to the Route 75 and Birch Bay Plain. And we've had a series of meetings already, and we'll update you that when we we'll move at the conclusion of that process. But I would say that's our main project. Another way that we want to address this issue is looking at additional microtransit options. So Blinden Hawk was wildly successful. So we want to take and see it. Can we put that model elsewhere? A couple of things that we need to talk about is, you know, the financial stability of that. It's an expensive service to put out there. So do we need to make choices of running really a more expensive, less efficient service by our current standards to meet the needs of folks who are kind of out on the fringe or really have not another options to get into town? A couple other things we'll do is conducting a cross-county paratransit study that was scheduled for 2022 and we weren't able to accomplish that. Also a high-frequency corridor study and continuing to increase the ADA access at our bus stops and replace bus shelters. So again, not just ridership and uh, bus service, but also the amenities that can help address these equity issues. No, no, that's their second point. No, there. not yet. Okay, sorry. I thought there was another There is. It's just further down the line. One of the things that uh, I think commendable to to the team and, and Tim's team's leading the charge is uh, we've been in the past historically tied growth to population growth. And we're rethinking that and trying to look at what are the community needs and how do we best allocate resources to that, which, as Shonda said, like with on demand, that may change. So growth may be different forms than the traditional uh, way we've approached it. Hopefully I said that correctly, Tim, put words in my mouth. Yeah, no, I think that's correct. I mean, it's looking at uh, different allocation criteria, as you might remember from WTA 2040, where we talked about threes, looking at specific criteria for how we examine and how we expand our service. So that's that's what we've done differently, is it's not just a generic, hey, 2%, but what is it's tied to actually what's happening in the community. It's not just a generic number. Michael, you have a question? Yeah, just I remembering um, WTA 2040, we talked about serving priority populations. This current slide talks about overburdened communities. How different or similar are those ideas? We're defining those. Uh, so, so in the state conversations, they allow individual communities to define that. Uh, for their own communities. And so we've defined that through WTA 2040 as, as several specific groups. And you might recall it was low income populations, people with disabilities, um, and there's three other categories. And I, have to remember, I think there's seniors was the other, there's two more. Um, Somebody can help me out. Uh, yeah, yeah, that as well. Um, so we've defined it uh, slightly differently than maybe other communities, but it does fit within this overall. Uh, category. It, it's a good point. We should revise the slide to have because that is the uh, criteria is uh, overburdened communities and vulnerable populations. So we should add, add that just to be clear. So just to clarify, we previously defined priority populations. Are we still using those priority populations and now we're just relabeling re them uh, overburdened communities or are they different? Well, I think we see the, these as the same. And the language we're using here is from the state, which is using a language of overburdened communities. And so when, when we do our assessment, we're using our own specific definitions. When it gets to the state level, they, they take a look at it as well. Um, but they, this is the way they've, they've identified it. The state is kind of identifying overburdened communities as locations and vulnerable populations is people. And so that's kind of the, the approach. So you may have a overburdened community that's based on the location because of health or air quality or those kinds of things that may not be a vulnerable population. 
um, but trying to hit both of those. And so that's kind of the way they're defining it. If that makes sense, Michael. It does. I think I prefer our way because location, <laughs> location is often too simple. Uh, I know places in town where you can get advantaged and disadvantaged people living not more than a few blocks from each other. So, I mean, anyway, thank you. I'll update that, Michael. Thank you. All right. The um, next party action would maintain staffing levels. Uh, that's been challenging with the pandemic. So a couple of things that we have done is what we're currently in negotiations. Vanessa's team has, stand, has stood up year round operator recruiting versus just doing this at many at times throughout the year. We have mentoring programs, educational opportunities. Um, and another new one has been listening sessions with Les where he has really invited folks to just sit down and talk about whatever they wanna talk about. Um, less on the people side, more on the comfort side. We're installing air conditioning on the buses and looking at some different opportunities for fueling sources. Um, got reviewing innovative set solutions. So this was part of WTA 2040. And the things that we're talking about here are transit-oriented development, um, funding projects through the Transit Access Fund. There are a couple applications that have come in that we'll be assessing um, how we fund those and looking at um, the BRT lines. So all of these pieces just kind of lay out over the next uh, 20 years to get us to that 2040 plan. Okay. If I could just kudos to Eric and Shelly and the team on there that created a mentoring program that uh, is, is pretty cool. It's a pilot program. We'll see how it, how it goes, but, but kudos to them for thinking of it and doing that. Okay. All Jamie. All Jamie. Okay. Okay. Next slide. All right, so our other um, priority was a state of good repair and planning for the future, and these all tie, tie into that. Um, Andy's leading the development of a Moab campus design project. So rather than trying to think about how we develop North Lot, North Lot, North Lot, Midway, our facilities in Moab all individually, how can we program all of those together? Because a lot of conversation we had is which domino do you pull to start that? And we really didn't have that line laid out. This also ties into how do we partner um, with the Linden Park and Ride out at there and the land that we have out in Linden that we haven't been fully utilizing. So how do we develop this whole campus to integrate and work together? Um, we were placing the vehicles in um, a timely manner. So we're assessing and maintaining our state of good repair. And again, looking at what's the best vehicle for the job? Do we need a 40 foot bus everywhere? Can we go for smaller vehicles? The van pool rules have changed to a rideshare program, so we can use smaller vehicles. So again, looking at how that can serve folks differently. The grant environment, we talked a little bit about that. The requirements are focusing less on ridership and more on serving populations, developing equity and accessibility. We've talked a little bit again about the external factors, the rising prices and the supply chain disruption, we're still working through those. The prices are still continuing to increase. You'll see that reflected in the budget, um, which is forcing us to sort of renegotiate our contracts, reassess our vendor situation, um, really take care of what our must pays are, and then how that impacts some of our optional expenses. I think we're to slide six, please. All right. So now we'll talk about how all of those things start to form and look into numbers on an income statement. So here's our intent and our outcomes for the budget. Um, again, we want the budget to resource to the mission and our priorities. And then the outcomes are addressing the three E's as we implement 2040, uh, addressing goals of our partners by increasing equity, eliminating barriers and serving priority populations, and then continuing to show the value of the clean WTA. Les said it really did the other day that we're we sort of compete for our tax dollars, right? Um, we do have the 0.65%, but if we had to do that, why would people fund WTA? And I think that can be a heart of one of our questions is what value are we providing to the community to continue that support for our services? All right, new positions. So we're asking for seven new positions in this budget. Um, four of them are the safety positions we talked about to stand up that division. Additionally, one procurement specialist to help with facilitating and really addressing a backlog we have in procurement for all of the projects and the opportunities that we want to do next year. You'll see those coming up. 
and then two administrative positions to support payroll and benefits. So in addition to Lori being really our only payroll person, we have Jen in HR who is really our only benefits person. So we're looking to build some depth and some redundancy there um, and bringing on a, a manager position to like oversee those and create a triad for that information. And then eventually work timekeeping from our three timekeeping systems into that fold also. So we really have a comprehensive look at that and I'll try to address those single single points of failure. And with lipid industry standards, and we've grown over the years, we kept one payroll person and now we're close to 300 people and industry standards so we probably should have three people working on that as a proper ratio. So we're trying to get to that point, um, as Eric said, uh, when you're talking to retention, if you can't get people paid uh, in a timely manner or it's, or it's not coming out correctly, um, it causes issues. <laughs> and actually, the payroll position will be moving under HR. So we've looked at our structure and we had payroll and benefits, two managers, two directors, and then Vanessa and I are trying to talk. So we're going to consolidate that so we really have one yeah, single right. point of decision making so yeah, that will help, we'll help the team feel like we can actually move forward and make some progress. Next slide, please. It looks like we may have some comments. Josh, can you see? We'll chat. And chat. We were thinking that. Eric, any questions? It had to do with uh, WT. Mary added the priority populations are defined as low income households, comma, black, comma, indigenous, and people of color in the community, disabled populations, persons over 65 years, and zero car households. So thank you for that. And then Eric uh, Davidson asked, out of curiosity, what is the threshold for low-income households? I don't know that answer. Um, yeah, well, I, we can answer that off more. Okay. And, and I would just uh, discourage to use the chat as it doesn't show up in the record that easily. Yeah. So thank and that, that's why, yeah, if we can read those into the record, but please try to refrain from chat because it doesn't get captured for the record. Okay. All right, so some operating initiatives you'll see in the budget. Um, the first one is what Tim was talking about, the increase in paratransit service to Birch Bay and Blaine. Um, we're also gonna be conducting some studies we weren't able to accomplish this year, the high frequency corridor, the cross county paratransit. We'll do the uh, Linden Hobby evaluation and see how that works in other areas of our community. And then we'll also be doing an economic study coming later to, again, enhance and talk about the value WTA provides. So the number of jobs we create, um, how many trips we provide for folks to work and school, and how we get folks um, moving from where they are to where they need to go, really, so they can participate in life and activities. Yeah, I think that's all I got on that one. Can I clarify one of this list? Um, the Linden Hop evaluation is listed here. And just to clarify that project, it is an evaluation. Um, as you might recall, uh, there was an outside evaluation by the FTA, but this is WTA's specific evaluation of that service. But more importantly, it's to look at the, uh, the feasibility of that, uh, that type of service for other areas of, of our service area, um, primarily uh, for Dale and, and First Bay Blaine, for the two areas that were identified in WTA 2040. So just to clarify that it's looking at how that model can work in other areas of the community to see if that's a future initiative at the WTA. And related to that, I think, well, originally, I'm, I'm going to put Sat Paul on the hot spot, but when we talked about this, we talked about public private uh, partnerships, and this is totally public. And I'm wondering if, if when we go in the future, maybe if we look at Ferndale next. Can we do a hybrid of somehow public private so that it isn't <clears> such <throat> a heavy burden on WTA? We can partner with an Uber or Lyft type organism, you know, group and use that for some of the transport as opposed to being all WTA. Absolutely, that will be one of the yeah. options that we'll consider, whether okay. it's a whether it's WTA run, whether it's a hybrid, whether it's fully the public private partnership with the cooperative. There's various models out there that yeah. we use. I think. Linden and the Uber Lyft model might not work because we just don't have operators. Yeah. But if you get Ferndale a little bit closer to the population of Bellingham, it might work. Yeah. There are three. <clears throat> there are three primary providers of that sort of service around the country, and we'll be looking into uh, those models that they provide. Some are simply just technical support to services you provide. Some 
do the operations, some do the, the full, uh, full service. So we'll look at those options. Great, thanks. And then on the economic study, we, we kind of track social value and we're tracking environmental value, but we are curious about what's our economic value to the community. So, you know, direct jobs, induced jobs, indirect jobs, um, the economic output that WTA has to this, this community. So we're kind of hitting that, those three legs of the stool of what that value proposition is to the community to have that information. And Seth, while you have a comment, you mentioned. Yeah, yeah I, I, I have a comment that, uh, yes, I've been talking about this for several years, as you all remember. Uh, I wanted to suggest that like there are enough transit agencies, uh, like just in Washington state. Uh, why don't the agencies get together and, uh, and create our own app? Uh, there are, I think there's a lot of opportunity uh, that, uh, that a lot of people uh, who would sign up uh, who are not only uh, considering as an income proposition, job proposition, but as a community service proposition also. Uh, 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 and that's a value uh, uh, added thing. And, and I think that uh, the inquiring more about it uh, and, and uh, in different communities, especially in our rural areas where those companies don't want to get into rural areas, just like broadband, all these things we have, have in our nation, and nobody wants to serve a rural population. And they are always left, left out of, uh, of the uh, urban uh, services uh, we, uh, we are able to provide because there's no money in it, uh, and, uh, or there's less money in it. I think that making an effort like that and, uh, and which could benefit uh, rural areas in much better way. And these people who will be participating, uh, they will be from among themselves uh, who may wanna drive only twice a day, uh, I mean, twice a week. If we have a system, we can sign up and approve and, and then people wanna do that, uh, provide the service in their own neighborhoods or on the, in their own area. It, it could catch on, uh, at least I believe that, but uh, I would say that, you know, this could be brought up in your uh, transit uh, uh, organizational meetings uh, with other people that uh, that time has come that we should start thinking in those terms. Thank you. And there are uh, organizations around the country that are doing that sort of uh, assistance in bringing drivers and riders together yeah. Facilitate right here. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, just a quick comment on the Linden Hop. Um, here at the center, we've actually had a couple people inquiring about housing in Linden, um, specifically be, uh, because of access to uh, the Linden Hop service. So um, it is the word is getting out about it and how it's uh, serving the community. Thanks. Okay, next slide, please. Um, this slide shows our capital issues. I'll try and move a little faster. Um, it's a partial list of one year of the capital, the six year capital plan. And I think we've talked about what all of these projects do and look like. Um, it's, I will say we have a very long wish list that you'll see coming up later and we'll be meeting next week to try to evaluate and prioritize these items. We'll get to the numbers now. So the next slide should be the income statement. I know you're so excited. I know where's Maureen? Usually she's the best one about this. All right. So um, the right, the far right column is the 2022 projection. So not our budget, but what I expect will happen by the end of the year. Um, you can see compared to 23 um, operating revenues. So from our fair revenue is a little bit increased. We don't have anything actively planned to increase ridership. Mm -hmm. So uh, ridership is not up where it was at 2019. So we have just a little small increase in that. Plus we also deliberately have fair revenue declining with the year right free and some of our agreements with Western and Whatcom. Um, Sales tax revenue, you can see it's quite high. Um, we're expecting to be almost 10% above budget for the end of 2022. So we're looking that optimistically. We didn't really see the impact of COVID on our sales tax revenues. So we're hoping that trend will continue. 
you know, COVID relief funds. And then the other large one is the operating grant. So that reflects the new grants that we expect to receive from the Move Ahead Washington program, <clears throat> um, really specifically with the Youth Ride Free program. Um, down on expenses, you can see the wages and salaries. So that's the piece that we'll be continuing to work on as we work through negotiations. I'm expecting 4.3 million in those COVID relief payments from last year, this year. Um, benefits, everything else is up. Um, a couple questions that um, I was asked about outside services, you can see that that's almost double what we're expecting to spend this year. A lot of that is for the projects that we weren't able to complete. We have two contracts we're looking to let this year in 23 for a grant specialist and a graphic specialist. We want to try that um, versus bringing new employees on to help us manage those grant opportunities and also our storytelling. Um, a little bit of additional money for bringing the EMC back on and then some temporary help. But really, it just reflects the increased costs of everything. The fuel budget uh, is a little bit higher than what you're seeing for the end of 22, but it's actually double what we budgeted for in 22. So you see a little bit of a net operating income there. And then we get down to capital. Again, a lot of these capital projects have rolled forward. Um, and we will address them in 23. And we're looking at about a $5.3 million loss. That's really typically what we end up budgeting for WTA. There will be some movement within this, right? We won't get every one of these figures throughout the year. And we will be coming back likely after the first of the year to amend the budget. And we can give you a better picture on what that looks like. And then there's just a couple pictures in here of the graphics of here's the budgeted revenues. You can see the big portion is sales tax, and then all the other portions are, are a very small percentage of that. The green is grant revenue. The next page are our expenses at 58 million. Um, again, the blue and the orange are wages and salaries and employee benefits. Um, the other dark orange is our capital expenditures. But the story I wanted to show, and this is a lot of these are discretionary expenses. Oh. There's some options within a lot of these discretionary. Did you say not? Are discretionary. Or sorry, are well, not discretionary. Not, yeah, Thank must pay. Our, yeah. our must pay. Mandatory. Um, yeah. So we have some things within the must pays that are up to our discretion. But really, most of these we need to spend to keep WTA running. So there's not a lot extra left over for some of our optional types of expenditures. And I think that was the important thing of putting this into auditorial is to see how much between the uh, state could repair the 13.4 wages and the benefits. You can start seeing where we start getting discretionary dollars is relatively small in comparison. Um, and that's the, the challenge that, uh, that we're trying to face is how and Todd, Todd has a question. Yeah, so could you go back to, I think it's slide 10. Uh, on the COVID safety payments, the 4.3 million that we had this year, if that would be down to zero. What, what is that exactly that <clears throat> was gonna completely go away? Um, that was the agreement that we had made to um, pay all employees employed on December 31st, January 1st. $5,000, and then they have the opportunity to earn four quarterly payments of $2,750. Okay. Um, we used that, the American Rescue Plan funds. So that program is ending, and those funds. Okay, yeah, I thought it was payments for masks and safety stuff, but I, no. I got that. Thanks. I think I get my hand oh. down. Um, and then just a note on um, cash. There aren't any cash figures in here, but um, Seth Paul asked about that. So our cash today at 1020, 1020 is undesignated at 27.8 million. So that's what we can really use to fund operations, continue our day-to-day -day expenses, and our reserves that are restricted both by policy, 20.9 million. So we're at 48.7 million in cash as of today. So part of that story will be telling how do we plan to spend those dollars over time um, and not put it all in one basket. The next page is the capital projects. This is in your packet. You can take a look at really what we're looking at spending. The majority next year are buses. These were really delayed from receipt in 2022. And then you can see some other large things at the campus, design, um, charging facilities, 
and a number of other things that uh, maintain the state of good repair and enhance our working environment. And then the next steps will be, um, we'll come back to the board November 17th with a five-year projection with cash flow and expenditures, um, asking for approval on December 8th, and then rounding back to the questions we asked at the beginning. How does this align with your priorities for WHA and the needs of your constituents? Do they meet our needs and deliver value? And are we missing anything? All right, so any questions on these to the board or to us here uh, from the board? Please feel your email, call me if there's some things like some other things you want to talk about further over the next couple of weeks. And we're setting the public hearing for this yeah. 17th, right? We have, to, we have yes. to vote on that. With the mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So we're requesting to set the hearing yeah. for November 17th. So I just meant that there's time to yeah. answer those questions. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Today. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. So yeah, to get this on the November 17th agenda, I'd entertain a motion to set a public hearing for the 2023 budget uh, on November 17th. So moved. Is there a second? Nobody else? Second. All right, seconded. Moving seconded. Any questions on that? Hearing none, we'll be voting in the negative. Anyone against the uh, motion, please vote now. Hearing none, that passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, we'll move on. Uh, we're getting close to the end of the hour, so I'm going to pick up the pace here. We're, we're going to move on to, I'm going to call it approval of minutes. It's a consent agenda, but only one item. I'd entertain a motion to approve the minutes from the September 15 meeting. So Is there a second? Second. Any questions, comments, or corrections? Hearing none, we'll be voting in the negative. Anyone against the motion, please vote now. Hearing none, motion carries. All right, reports to the board. Josh, mission statement update, bullet three. Yeah, good morning. Um, just wanted to mention that uh, you know, we're trying to provide leadership and creative and innovative transportation solutions. One of the projects that we're currently working on, I wanted to highlight this morning, and that is our efforts to improve wayfinding at our stations and eventually at our stops. Uh, we're looking at partnering with uh, a vendor who produces an app on their mobile device that allows people who are uh, have visual impairments, they can hold the app up and kind of scan the environment and it'll read kind of uh, 2D bar, 3D barcodes, kind of like a QR code, but it looks a little different than that. And it'll audibly tell them on their phone what's going on. Hey, this is a bus stop. This is uh, the restrooms are this way. The next bus is arriving in three minutes. It's the 20, uh, 232 downtown. <laughs> Whichever direction. Whichever that is. Way. <laughs> <laughs> Got to pick one I can remember. Okay. Uh, it also supports uh, wayfinding for those that uh, just want that information in general. So there's kind of two apps, one for those that uh, need the audible uh, assistance and, and have the visual impairments, and then uh, for those that just want that information in general ready handy if they can scan, a, uh, for example, a bay on a concourse downtown and understand where the, when the bus is coming. We're working right now through procurement of that and uh, hope to be rolling that out in uh, the next months. Uh, we're excited. It sounds like Western Washington University is also rolling out something similar to this, and pro probably the same product. Uh, so we'll have some good integration there. And I think it's going to be a really neat addition to this community to have this new wayfinding tool available uh, for all persons, that, especially those who have limited vision uh, capabilities. What are our innovative efforts? All right, any questions for Josh? Move on to the general manager's report. Yeah, I'll make sure we're done. Um, <laughs> I, we were, Maureen and I were back in uh, DC um, last week, uh, met with the congressional delegation, uh, the staffers, the, they're on, uh, they were all back in district, the, the members, but uh, met with the, the staffers, which actually was was very good because they're the ones that uh, are really delving into things. So, so that was good. Um, and then met with uh, some of the agencies as well including the uh, USD uh, Department of Transportation Build America Bureau. Um, they were very excited about the Moab campus, about the, uh, looking at transit-oriented development, and they have uh, resources to help us uh, kind of 
develop that, design that, kind of think through that. Um, so more to follow on on that, but it was a uh, um, it was a great uh, great discussion with them. And there's money that uh, Congress has put into DOT's budget to do those kinds of things that has not been tapped yet. So they're looking at ways of uh, spending that to, to prove value. So there's opportunities there. Uh, a couple of the big ticket items coming up for the board. Um, obviously, the budget will continue. Uh, zero emission bus transition plan will be coming back next month. Um, and then we've got uh, the electric bus order that will be coming next <laughs> month. And then the last thing is um, just want to make the board aware that uh, we are in conjunction with uh, some of the other transit agencies uh, in the region supporting a regional transit study. Um, we're applying for a uh, State DOT consolidated grant. Um, Skagit is uh, Transit has kindly taken the lead on that, but it's a consolidated effort. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me to study um, inter-county uh, public transportation along the I-5 corridor on that to to enhance that. So that's my report. Pending any questions? Any questions? All right. Any other business before the board today? Michael, oh, Michael. He's going old school. Just a quick one, Les, on that uh, coordinated study in the I-5 corridor. How far down the corridors will that go? It's going to go all the way to Everett, so it's Snohomish. Yeah, yeah it's, it's designed to then interact with the uh, Puget Sound improvements that are coming in the future, so it's going to go all the way down to the Puget Sound area. It, it's a 10 to 20 year look, and so as uh, Sound Transit comes farther north and those constructions um, trying to look at how can we be prepared for that. And I should mention it also includes Highland County. Yeah, not to leave them out. <laughs> does Sound Transit include the um, light rail system? It does. Yeah. So as Tim, we've been talking, it goes to Linwood and then it'll ultimately go to Everett in the 2030s. Um, that provides a very interesting, I think, from our perspective, uh, Whatcom County residents to connect to the Sound Transit train um, in Everett to be able to then go down to whether it's to the airport or you know games or just access Seattle or or East um, East King County so it provides some real interesting opportunities that we need to start thinking even though it's a little bit of ways away how do we work cooperatively to uh, to get people there? Cool. All right. Any other questions? Any other business or announcements? All right, hearing none, thanks everyone. Meeting adjourned. Have a great day.